Topic 9.1 Summary, Simple Harmonic Motion. We've already looked at simple harmonic motion in Topic 4, but now we're going to look at it a bit more quantitatively. This is a table uh, that you should become familiar with uh, as we study simple harmonic motion. It shows some of the quantities, symbols, and units involved in measuring a simple harmonic motion of an object. So first we'll start with displacement. Displacement is, uh, the symbol of course is X. Displacement is defined as the instantaneous distance of the moving object from its mean position. By mean position we mean the equilibrium or middle position. And displacement is usually measured in meters, although it certainly could be measured in any other distance units such as, say, centimeters or millimeters. The second quantity we want to talk about is amplitude, and the symbol for amplitude is a capital A, or X sub naught. Amplitude is measured in distance units, so usually meters, and the amplitude is the maximum displacement from the mean position. So if you have a, a mass that's bobbing up and down or sliding left to right, the amplitude would be the distance, the furthest distance, that the particle gets from the middle position at its extremes. Amplitude. Okay, frequency you're familiar with, and the symbol, of course, for frequency is a lowercase f, and frequency is measured in hertz, or seconds to the negative one, and the frequency is the number of round trips completed per second by the object that's moving back and forth. The number of oscillations per second is the frequency. Period, you're also familiar with. The symbol is capital T, periods measured in seconds. It's the time it takes to make one complete oscillation, or the time it takes to make one complete round trip. A quantity that you might not be as familiar with is phase difference. So, so suppose you have two waves arriving at the same instant, um, and the two waves have the same frequency. If the crest of one wave is arriving at the same time as the crest of the other wave, then we say these two waves are in phase. It also would mean that the trough of one wave would arrive at the same instant as the trough of the other wave. But what if one wave is arriving a little bit later than the other, such that the crests don't arrive at the same instant? Then one wave is, if you kind of imagine the, uh, the graph of the two waves, one wave is going to be shifted um, along the x-axis a little bit. And the amount of a cycle by which the second wave is shifted is called the phase difference. So if the two waves were arriving um, such that the crest of one wave was coinciding with the trough of the other wave, then the two waves would said, are said to be 180 degrees out of phase. So the symbol for phase difference is phi, and it's measured in radians or degrees. And if two waves are completely out of phase, if they're canceling each other, then we would say that they are 180 degrees out of phase, or pi radians out of phase. Another measurement that you might not be that familiar with is the concept of angular velocity. Angular velocity is sometimes called angular frequency, and the symbol is this lowercase omega, so don't call that W, call that omega. And the units for angular velocity are radians per second. And it's one way to measure uh, how many cycles are happening per unit time. But instead, instead of measuring it in cycles per second, which would be hertz, we measure it in radians per second. Okay, recall the requirements for simple harmonic motion. Uh, by substituting Hooke's law into Newton's second law, we can see that the acceleration is directly proportional but opposite in direction to the displacement. Okay, so this is an important kind of requirement for simple harmonic motion. All of the equations that we're about to look at uh, involve the uh, motion of an object that's in simple harmonic motion. So you've seen this kind of diagram before. Um, so make sure you can kind of understand that you have an object that's moving back and forth or bobbing up and down. It's got a middle position called the equilibrium position and then it has two extremes um, to the left in this in this particular diagram to the, all the way to the left would be one extreme all the way to the right would be another extreme halfway between those points would be called the equilibrium position we're used to measuring frequency in a hertz or cycles per second but for an oscillating object we will sometimes use a quantity called angular velocity or angular frequency the symbol is omega 
looks like that W, but don't call it W, and use this equation to convert from frequency in hertz to angular velocity in radians per second. So whenever you're doing a problem, um, make sure you're clear on whether you have been given the frequency in hertz or whether you're given the angular velocity in radians per second, and you may need to convert from one to the other. As an object in simple harmonic motion moves back and forth, its acceleration reaches the maximum at the extremes of its motion. Remember, that's because the force, because of Hooke's law, is at its maximum at the extremes of the particle's motion. And the acceleration is zero as it passes through the equilibrium position. This equation allows us to calculate the instantaneous acceleration of the oscillating mass if we know the angular velocity, omega, and the instantaneous displacement, x. Remember, displacement is measured from the equilibrium position. The next few equations will allow us to calculate the instantaneous displacement or the instantaneous velocity of the mass that's undergoing simple harmonic motion. Remember, an object undergoing simple harmonic motion is continually going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So where do we start? Where, where's the beginning of this? It's really important to understand how t is measured in these equations. In some of these equations, t equals zero when the mass stops momentarily at its maximum positive displacement. So imagine watching the mass going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and at one extreme when the mass stops just to turn around um, at the positive x value, you start your stopwatch, and that's t equals zero um, at, the, at the maximum displacement. In others of these equations, t equals zero when the mass is passing through the equilibrium position moving in the positive direction. So imagine the mass moving back and forth, you're watching it go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and just as it's going from the negative to the positive direction, passing through the equilibrium position, you start your stopwatch, t equals zero then. So there's two different situations, t can equal zero in two different situations. Before you apply these equations, you have to be certain that you understand where the mass was when the clock was started. So this is the equation that you would use if you want to know the displacement of a particle um, at time t when starting at maximum velocity from the equilibrium position. So to use this equation, the clock was started, t equals zero, as the mass was passing through the equilibrium position. And we need to know the angular velocity in radians per second, the elapsed time, that is how much time has gone past since the object passed through the equilibrium position the last time around. And we need to know the amplitude, which of course is the maximum displacement uh, that the object reaches. And the result of this equation will give us the actual position of the object at this moment. Notice that this equation looks almost the same as the previous one, except this one, instead of having a sine, has a cosine in it. And this equation is used for finding the displacement of a particle at time t when starting at rest from the position of maximum displacement. So in this equation, we started the stopwatch when the mass reached its maximum positive displacement, and we measured the time from that point on. We use this equation if we want to know the instantaneous velocity of a particle, and the time in this equation is measured from maximum velocity as it passed through the equilibrium position. Okay. This equation will also help us to find the instantaneous velocity, and the only difference is, is that in this equation, the clock was started when the mass reached its position of maximum displacement. Okay? And notice in this equation, instead of having a cosine, we have a sine. This is another equation that will allow you to find the instantaneous velocity of a particle, and this is used if you know the maximum velocity, that's when it passes through the equilibrium position, and in this equation, the time is measured from the equilibrium position. So when the mass passes through the equilibrium position, that's when t equals zero for this equation. This equation will allow you to find the instantaneous velocity if you know the maximum velocity. That's the velocity when we go through the equilibrium position. And in this case, the time is measured from the position of maximum displacement. So same as a previous equation, except t, now the clock starts instead of when we pass through the equi equilibrium position, the clock starts when we reach the maximum uh, displacement value. Notice there's a sign in this equation, 
instead of the cosine in the previous equation. Also, as it says in the slides, uh, this equation and the one in the previous slide are not in your data booklet. The previous two equations allowed you to calculate the instantaneous velocity uh, as a function of time. This equation will allow you to calculate the instantaneous velocity of the mass uh, as a function of, of where it is, of its displacement. Okay, let's take a look at the energy changes uh, during simple harmonic motion. As an object moves back and forth in simple harmonic motion, uh, as the object passes through the equilibrium position, it's going to have its maximum velocity and therefore its maximum kinetic energy. Uh, when the object passes through the equilibrium position, it has no potential energy, okay, because the net force on it, for an instant, is zero. On the other hand, as a particle reaches maximum displacement at either end of its movement, then it stops as it turns around, so at that instant it has zero velocity and therefore no kinetic energy, but at that position the spring is either stretched or compressed, and therefore all of the energy is in the form of potential energy. If we want to know the total energy of the mass, uh, it's going to be the sum of the kinetic and potential energies at any particular instant. This equation will allow you to calculate the uh, kinetic energy of an object of a mass that's uh, oscillating in simple harmonic motion if you know its angular velocity in radians per second and if you know its amplitude x naught and if you know its displacement its instantaneous displacement x that will allow you to calculate the kinetic energy at that instant we know that the kinetic energy should be highest when the mass passes through the equilibrium position because that's when it's traveling the fastest and again, if we take a look at this equation, as the mass passes through the equilibrium position, the displacement at that instant will be zero. So notice that this term here, x naught squared minus x squared, will be at its largest value when x naught equals zero. So the equation uh, makes sense in terms of what we know. This equation will allow us to calculate the total energy of the mass. And again, if you compare this with the previous equation, um, Essentially what they're doing is they're finding the kinetic energy when the mass travels through the equilibrium position. And because at any other point the kinetic energy will be smaller, but it will have potential energy. And because law of conservation of, of energy, the total energy is going to be the same as the maximum kinetic energy. So that's really what this equation is solving for. This equation will allow you to calculate the potential energy of the mass um, as a function of its displacement. That's it. See you next time.